All right, and we're live. Um, so I have a special guest with me today. I got Zevi from Seekers of Unity. Um, he's a huge channel, so <laughs> I'm pretty sure some of my uh, people that watch me are well acquainted. Um, I think what I adore, you know, just kind of just throw in some introductions and I'll, I'll allow you to say some things. Um, I think what I adore about your work is that I really feel the, uh, you know, the, the perennial sort of message embodied in your, in your work, you know, um, and then you kind of spend time thinking through it, having guest speakers, um, and, and even just the idea of approaching and educating us on, you know, the Kabbalah and, and Jewish mysticism stuff. It's always enlightening. Cause I don't, I, I think I've tried. Uh, looking for Jewish mysticism and it seems like the only prominent channel that pops up is yours. <laughs> you know, if I'm, if I'm being honest, I mean, there is some channels here and there, but it seems like the most prominent amount of information on YouTube seems to be yours. Um, with that being said, I'll, I'll hand it over to you. Thanks for having me, Javier. It's very cool. I mean, I love talking about these subjects. They're very close to my heart and they're always in my mind. So when you reached out to chat about them, I was very happy to, to indulge the opportunity. So thank you. And yes, I think I think the questions of mysticism and perennialism uh, in every tradition are are super important questions. And I think if there is if they do exist, and if they're not just a fantasy of our imagination or of simply of our you know neurochemical makeup, then there's some very real implications for the way that we live our lives in relation to ourselves, to each other, to the world around us. Um, the relationship between religions, between religion and modernity, between religion and science. These are all questions that are very deeply impacted if this particularly understood perennially um, is, is, is a true construct and not just a, a fantasy. So I'm, I'm delighted to be talking about these things in general and here with you and delighted to be able to share my tradition. I think there is, I think Jewish mysticism has been very underserved both um, in the scholarship up until at least Shalom started working at Jewish mysticism didn't exist as part of the conversation. And uh, it, it pains me to hear that if you're searching the only, that the only thing that you're finding is me, that's, that's a bit of a heavy responsibility, but there are some other great scholars creating content. A good friend of mine, Dr. Justin Sledge over his channel Esoterica did a brilliant series on the history of Jewish mysticism. Um, and his work is fantastic, and and there are some others, but I hope that I hope that in the next few years there'll be more as well. They'll see that this is a real option, and that there is real interest in it. So thank you for having me, and thank you for your kind words. Yeah, uh, that 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 is the part that kind of um, is kind of sad, um, and also at the same time, uh, we we can feel the the, the weight of that responsibility. Um, you know, I noticed this in some of my philosophical circles that I'm in. Not a lot of people knew about Ibn Arabi, for example. And I thought he was such an important thinker. Um, and the implications, if you actually take his stuff seriously, um, I felt like actually following Ibn Arabi kind of led me to perennialism. It kind of yeah. made a very clear cut case uh, for perennialism, in my opinion. But I still have to, you know, I'm still thinking through it um, because I don't think it's enough to sort of, um, I guess, depend my thinking on one thinker. Um, Good. And I hope you don't stop. I hope you never stop thinking. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, so you know, I, I think the biggest concern when we talk about perennialism, and and the biggest concern that a lot of people against perennialism kind of raise against, is this idea of we're negating difference, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Um, and I've been thinking about you know how do we approach this idea of not negating difference. Um, and I actually think that, for example, the Trinity model can be a useful model to show that we don't need to negate um, difference. We can actually, there can be opposites, but it's not a negation, it's a distinction. Um, and this, I think, can be kind of a useful model to understand that just because something is relatively opposite um, in our understanding, it doesn't have to negate the other. It can just be simply a distinction and that the essence itself is what is what sort of unifies the whole thing, um, the whole three in one concept. I think perennialism is a very big, big, you know, not just a trinity, but a big, you know, thing that holds more numbers than the, the, the three. Uh, and I, I think that's kind of useful to consider. Um, 
I'm, I'm curious about how you feel, because I, I, I personally feel like when we talk about perennialism, I am not, I'm like not too much of a fan of like, I guess, arguing for the experience part. Because I think the experience part is, I, I think that's because I, I watched your video on the, the perennial, like perennialism almost got, you know, outed, <laughs> you know, and um, I was like, you know, why is it that we're obsessing over mystical experience? I mean, I think the mystical experience was the means of understanding this, but um, I think sort of premising the argument of mystical experience to sort of making perennialism true is, uh, I think there's another way to go about it. I think perhaps the critiques are right. You know, there's no such thing as a pure experience. There's always a mediated experience. Um, I recently read some of Shalom's, a uh, little bit of beginning on his Kabbalah and symbolism. Um, and I thought it was just a wonderful way he was describing between mystical authority. I mean, well, uh, mystical revolution and, and uh, mystical uh, like conservation where he's saying that depending on what authority you fall under, um, religious authority you fall under, those uh, authorities will become projected into the experience. And I thought, wow, that is a really good case to show how um, our predispositions or our sort of the way our desire gathers towards a specific direction towards the divine sort of manifests in that way. Um, but yeah, I'll, I'll let you kind of say what you think about all those things. I think you're muted, Zevi. Oh, okay. I'm. I'm. Thank you for telling me. Yeah, I think I think there are a lot of potential models to begin to think about um, identity and difference, and how those two things may coincide. And I think there's. Um, theological ways of going about that. I think that there's philosophical, interesting ways of going about that. And those are things which I think still need to be explored um, and are interesting avenues. I, I agree with you in that the emphasis to make a case for some sort of universality of mysticism or a contract of mysticism that it can have some sort of common features across traditions, that the, be that the best place to do that is not is an inexperience. And for many for many decades, the argument was made it was an experientialist or, exper or exper like experience-centric form of perennialism, something which I outlined in the in a, the history of mysticism that we did on the channel, or the history of the construct of mysticism. Um, and I think that the notion of appealing to experience was a very psychologically appealing one because it was a safe space from the onslaught that religion was facing during the Enlightenment. And experience seemed to be something which was untouchable. Like you can come and prove to me from today to tomorrow why my notion of God may be a bad idea after the discoveries of, you know, Newton and and Kepler and Galileo and, uh, and Darwin in particular. But if I had an experience, that experience is true to me, who are you to tell me that what I experienced was not true? Um, and, and it does seem from from later empirical studies that have been done on, on mystical experiences, that these experiences do seem to the person that experienced them to be incredibly true, uh, to be more real in some sense than their everyday waking experience. This is something which William James already uh, no, you know, takes note of and, and, and further scholars. The problem of appealing to experience, as you're saying, is that experience is fundamentally inaccessible, that the experience of the other is that thing which which, which I can have no experience to, and therefore has no, there's no claim that could be made with experience. We kind of extrapolate from experience. We can't even really compare experiences because they're a black box and we just don't have any access to them. Yeah, and, the, and the notion of experience itself is, is, a very, is, is kind of a dubious philosophical category, uh, which, which there are many philosophers who, who, who call it into question because of how uh, inaccessible it is. And I'm, I'm not saying I agree with that line of thinking, but just that it, it is a line of thinking. And furthermore, with the with Katz's um, work, where he went through went at great lengths to demonstrate the through you know a Kantian prism through the the, the deep med, the deep mediation of every experience. In that case, which Shalom also buys into as well, it 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 put, it put this notion of experience as the core strength the prop for a for a perennialistic proposition. Uh, at a very weak footing and and i think this is all for good reason i think this is all part of a 
healthy progress in our understanding of mysticism. And I think that sometimes people get a bit disheartened and disillusioned by this assault on experience. And they feel like the house, the car, you know, the house is tumbling down and what are we left with? But I think that there's actually, it's a healthy development. And I, I think it's a criticism which we should welcome because we want to be doing this critically. We don't want to be following illusions. We want to be following what we can, what is the most, you know, verifiable truth that we can come to. But very early on, the, in a response to Katz, um, by made by Houston Smith, who was a fantastic scholar of religion, of world renowned, and himself a committed perennialist and even traditionalist. And Smith, in an early series of debates, uh, in in an exchange of letters, uh, in I forget which journal they've been published in, but but I could find it for the audience if they'd like to see. Um, Houston says that looking at experience for the core of of mysticism and for a perennialist argu per perennialistic argument is the wrong place to be looking and he says that that's never the claim that the perennialists who knew what they were doing were actually making he says that the case has to be made in the words of the mystic what does the mystic say when they come out of his or her experience and Katz says we have to compare the theories of the mystic the unit of theories and whether that's their their mythologies or their metaphysics or their theologies, what are they proposing the nature of the world to be? And a lot of that comparative work was then taken up and had been taken up already by people like Jung and Campbell in, in the field of mythology and Eliot in the field of, of you know, metaphysics and religious thought. And, and that work continues to be done. And where I see the important work that I'm trying to do is really in the comparative metaphysics because we can't access the experience. And because experiences are mediated, what we can do is we can look at what are the theories that are being proposed and is there a commonality of theory? And the commonality of theory is both there because there is real historical interaction between mystical traditions. And we've spoken about that a lot on the channel. And that's part of this story. That's part of the history of this great narrative. The influence, for example, that Neoplatonism through Plotinus and through the works that get translated and misattribute, mis misattributed go on to influence Jewish, Christian, and Muslim mystics, and, and they share a language and construct because of him, or because of contact that happens at you know special moments between East and West. But beyond that, and through that, uh, also moments where we see where there seems to be no contact, and there seems to be. An indigenous arrival at similar propositions metaphysically uh, and to me that's really the interesting line of reasoning of what is what is the propositions which we come to and what is the, the way of being the way conception of reality the ethics the practices the techniques the uh the the logics the languages the poetry that we can build we can you know start to build together a, a universal narrative that might shine some light on how we might be able to live our lives going forward because it's very hard to build a universal experience and and it, it would be boring to collapse all of mysticism into the hegemony of one single experience and at, for that reason i don't particularly like the work being done looking at the um the 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 the, the what's what's the term the pce the the pure the the uh the pure consciousness experience, the work of, of Fulman. I, 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 don't, I don't think it's interesting because it because it, it just collapses all, all the mysticism to something which seems very, very vanilla and very benign and very, very uninspiring. We should we should leave the experiences to be what they are and, and leave them to be. There has to be some mystery and, and we cannot know what happens in a person's private experience. Um, but we can begin to do comparative work on a structural level on, on what are the what are the metaphysics what are the ethics what's the what's the psychology here what's the what's the what's the neurology involved in and i think that's where the important work is so i, I i'm in agreement with you on that yeah um <laughs> i'm happy we both agree on that you know that, that experience itself is probably not the best route to take even though it has proven some fruitful work i think um but yeah i, I, I was wondering what, what you would think about this um, when you talk about metaphysical comparisons, I was talking to my friend uh, Daniel today, um, where he's talking about, you know, there's one thing that all religions can't deny is that they all have sort of general concepts about the divine that is sort of agreeable, right? It's the generality. But when we start getting to the specifics, that's where we all differ and disagree upon. Um, and so he says, uh, so I was kind of posing the argument of if we take, I, I always liked Isl the Islam's notion of uh, you know, God being unique. And I, don't, I, don't, I think that is a very good way to look at the divine 
if we have like this holding of like a unique universalism, it holds, in my opinion, sameness and difference, right? It would hold this place where the unique universalism sort of reflects um, the, the person and even the religion itself, right? It reflects the form. Um, now, I, I, think the, I think the danger uh, with universalism that I'm like trying to avoid is like, I don't want, for example, I, I think what I love about perennialism is that it's a very advocate for love, right? Um, what I don't want is a, a universalism of tolerance. Because I, I think tolerance is a very bad universalism. And I think that's what a lot of the proponents are thinking when we talk about this perennialist idea as that we're sort of advocating for some like naive tolerance of just everybody and everything um, to where it doesn't even require me to join any religion. In fact, I think the reason why um, people are pulled towards certain religions and there's so many theories on dispositions and temperament um, that I can't even begin to decipher which one is correct, but just the idea of that there is a temperament that I sort of fall under and all of a sudden the religion just appeals to me more than the rest. Why is it that, you know, when I talk to my mother, for example, um, she's just not interested in learning about the other religions. She's just not interested. She's just solely content with her Christianity. Um, you know, the, I, I think there's room to, to discover and, and sort of uh, explain and describe why that is. Um, and, and to kind of show like even the idea of parentalism being accepted I think there's a room to where perennialism is sort of implicitly accepted in the idea that someone is solely content in their tradition, because I believe all the religious traditions themselves hold these universal interactions like Christianity has, you know, love your neighbor, right? You don't have to sort of give in to their tradition. You can just love them as they are. So there is this space and holding of difference and universalism that's very unique and very beautiful. Um, it's just, it seems to me, in my opinion, I must have fallen under the temperament where I accept perennialism <laughs> because I just love too much of all the varieties of religion. I just can't stop, you know, essentially. So, yes, I think, I think, I think, listen, I think ultimately, like, what's, what's the goal of the soul? The goal of the soul is to create uh, people that are capable of living lives that are full of beauty, love, compassion, understanding, acceptance. Now, if someone is getting there through the practice of Catholicism and they don't have much interest in exploring the spirituality of other religious traditions, or someone is getting there as a devoted uh, Buddhist and they 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 don't really care much for Islam, then <laughs> as, as far as I'm concerned, that's 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 great and that's wonderful. And if only there were more people like that. So. I, I don't think I don't think there's any need to to try and convert people to perennialism that are doing their religion in the way that's bringing them to to love to loving kindness uh, and compassion. So so your mother's probably doing just great, and and she doesn't need to become a perennialist. I think that I think though that for many people that there is an appeal and there is a beauty that's that can be added to their own religious practice and experience um, when they see that what's happening here is a universal story. I don't know how I feel about this word universalism. It's a word which kind of rubbed me the wrong way. It's a word which I haven't used so much in my own self descriptions. But but understand that this is a universal story, and that we're here together. And you know, there's this famous moment when it, with the NASA projects where the astronauts go off to space and they look back and they see the Earth as this tiny blue like marble floating through space, and and they have this this oceanic feeling of of compassion and love for for this tiny little ball that's not like split up into like even our separation between countries and borders and geographies and nationality is like, it's all this tiny little ball floating through space. And I think there's something of that modern consciousness, which comes with the 21st century, which comes with, with modernity, which comes with globalization, which comes with, 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 with a thousand things, with the, with the technology that we have at our hand, that the two of us can be talking, right? I think those things in many ways force new generation to rethink religion and to rethink it in a universal light and in a perennialistic fashion. And I don't think that the ultimate destination is tolerance. Tolerance is like a very low bar as far as a, like you tolerate someone else. It's like, I don't really like them or whatever. Like I'll put up with them. I think the goal is love. Like I think I think that we're, we humans are, are capable of really beautiful, tremendous things. And one of those definitely up there in that list is love. And we're capable of loving ourselves. 
we're capable of loving those around us and we're capable of learning how to love all of existence and all of reality and all of nature. Uh, and that I think is what the mystics refer to when they speak of the love of God. They speak of God as, you know, the being and beyond. And and when when they speak about loving God, they speak about loving all of existence. And and I think to simply tolerate existence, it's like I tolerate God, I tolerate being, I tolerate the stranger, the the neighbor. No, like the idea is to, as you've been saying, to, to love the neighbor, to love the stranger. And I think that that's something which, if we listen to the mystics across traditions, uh, again, it's another theme of commonality, which we can learn from them. And we can learn the ways that we can gear our lives and our practice and our behavior to to making those realities not just lip service, but to making them reality and, you know, day by day more, more and more. Yeah, I think like, uh, yeah, tolerance is definitely a low bar. <laughs> um, and I think you know, for me, I've had such tangible experience and also just experience in reading the, the variety of different thinkers. Um, you know, even like Aldous Huxley text on the perennial philosophy, it actually felt like a very spiritual text to me, ironically, even though for him, it's like an anthology and he's sort of just sharing these quotes, but it felt like such a great spiritual text to me um, that it just, you know, the feeling itself didn't, I couldn't quite comprehend exactly what is it that I'm comprehending. Um, and, and the same thing I feel when I, when I had gone through this journey of sort of exploring Buddhism and Hinduism and, and, and Taoism, and it, I think the part was that when I'm interacting with these people, a variety of religions, I have it, I have a very hard time saying to myself, well, how is this person wrong? <laughs> how, how do I have the sole claim? How does my religion have the sole claim on truth? Um, and, 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 and that, that's the part that I think for me personally, and I, I know people can sort of grapple with that in different ways, but for me personally, I just couldn't fathom the idea. It just didn't make any sense um, that these people were necessarily wrong. I mean, there's just too much things to consider. Uh, you know, the way someone is born, their, you know, their psychology, what if, what if they experience trauma? Like, there's just so many factors involved. Um, to where I just I just can't accept this idea that we are the you know but there is again what there is this sort of ironic uh, exchange going on where all the religions sort of say that they have the uh, sole hold on truth which is the funny universalism that kind of gets caught in um, I think you you mentioned that you know you're not very fond of saying the word universalism I my friend Daniel he he actually said instead of universal let's say uh, ideas. <laughs> <laughs> There's a very common idea, um, which I, I think I'm going to start switching soon. Because <laughs> I, I, I do see and understand the distaste for universalism, but ideas, ideas themselves. And I, I actually even think, you know, when we talk about feelings, is that feeling, when I have a feeling and then I have a conflicting explicit idea, that feeling itself is an implicit idea that is causing conflict within myself. So it's two ideas. Um, the unfortunate part is I don't really know which one's correct or which one's wrong. <laughs> so I'm sort of working that out. But I really felt that when I was experiencing these uh, different religions, um, I felt a conflicting idea that I couldn't express. Um, and I think when I stumbled upon perennialism, that sort of clarified some things for me. And, and I think Shuan did a wonderful job for me to kind of go back into, <laughs> he saved me from going into like a new age spirituality, you could say. Right, where we look at the spiritual practices, the traditions as something that is a means. And I think what has been a great harm, at least, is that we all sort of perceive these rituals as an end in themselves. Whether we explicitly say that we're doing it for God or for not, um, there is a tendency that we like to sort of cling on to these rituals as of our soul um, path and end. Um, when, we're, when in reality, they are sort of a means to get to divine. And I, I think that's what I found really beautiful and sort of changed my perspective and wanted me to get back into um, religion again. <laughs> so. Yeah, I think, I mean, I think it's a, it's a really beautiful experience to be able to encounter the variety of religious traditions to play a bit on, on Huxley and, and, and James there. And it's it's a really compelling thing, and it's I think I think there's a capacity to see a lot of beauty in that, and I think the notions of like 
I have the truth and the whole truth and nothing but the truth, or we, you know, my own tradition has the truth and nothing else but the truth, and no one else has access to anything true. I think it's um it's a position which psychologically helps people, you know, hold on to a tradition throughout the ages and understand the value of that sociologically. But I think ultimately it's a it's a position which can be coming from a place of insecurity or immaturity. And I don't need to believe that I have the absolute truth to practice my tradition. I, I don't need to believe that I, I'm married to the most perfect human being ever to, to be having a loving relationship. I, I can conceptualize the possibility that bringing someone out there who's more beautiful or, or, or more smart or more whatever it is. But this is the person who I love. This is the person who I'm in relationship. This this person who I'm committed to. And this person who we're, you know, we're, we're in this together. And I think with religion, it's the same. Re religion, you don't have to have the, the perfect absolute truth to be deeply committed and in love with your own tradition. And I think that love doesn't have to preclude you from being infatuated and in love with, with other traditions as well. If it's done with respect to you know the own relationship that you're in, to use the metaphor that we're using before. And I think that sometimes letting go of this notion of the sole truth, the absolute truth, the only truth can be a very liberating experience. And, and I sometimes what we think is true is not really serving us. And when we can, when we can embrace a larger truth it can be very liberating and it can, and we can see things that we may not have seen before that would help us improve in our own relationship, in our own traditions, not, not to abandon them, God forbid. I think that, I think that that's a very healthy position to be open to. And I, and I think that it takes time to, to do that. And it takes a certain degree of certainty and security. And, and I think that the objective is not to become the problem with universalism that we've been saying here is when I when I think of universalism, I think of some sort of porridge where everything just gets mixed together and there's no differences, no differentiation, and it's all just, you know, Hegel has this term. He says in in the during nighttime, all calves are black because they're all dark. You can't see anything. They're all they've lost their color. They've lost their individuality. And they don't have any spots anymore. And I I like the spots of religion. I like I like that each religion has its own language, its own culture, its own practice. But I think that on top, like somewhere, either on top or beneath, however you want to conceptualize it, there is a place for universal level of discourse. There's an analogy which I think is helpful. There was a there was a Polish um, Jewish optometrist, uh, Zamenhof, living, um, I think it was before the Second World War. And he lived in a time of great strife. And he felt that the reason why there was so much fighting in the world was because people couldn't communicate. There was language barriers. And he created a language called, um, he created a universal language, which is called, uh, what's, it's called Esperanto. There you go, a bit of a, a senior moment, called Esperanto. And Esperanto was a very, very simple language uh, based on you know a mix of European languages, which was in a way which was the purpose was that all European countries could have a common language which they could speak. Now, if Zamenhof's idea was that everyone should stop speaking their native languages and only speak Esperanto, that would have been a really terrible idea because languages are beautiful and languages are music and their poetry and their culture and their love. To if if everyone was just speaking one really basic watered down language, that would be terrible. But that wasn't his idea. His idea was that the French would still speak French and they would love speaking French because they do. And the Spanish would still speak their rich, beautiful Spanish. And the Germans would sp still speak their terribly difficult, but beautiful, you know, 20, 20 syllable long words in German. And everyone would have their own languages, but on top of their language or beneath their language or in addition to their language, they would have this common language which they could all speak and they could all understand one another. And that's what I think that perennialism at its best can do for religion. Not that Muslims should stop being Muslims and Jews stop being Jewish and Muslims. Everyone should stay and do it because, because our religions are beautiful when they're done right. And they're so nurturing and they build community and they build ritual and they build life cycles and they allow us to celebrate and mourn and they allow us to, to be deeply surrounded by culture and beauty. And God forbid that anyone should, should leave their religion. But in addition to our religion, there should be some kind of religious Esperanto that we can all say, oh yes, I understand what it means when you do a Shabbat because I have a Sunday and I have a Friday and I do this. I understand when you cover your head because I do something similar. I understand your metaphysics when you talk about God and on all levels of religion from our practice, through our experience and our theories and our rituals, we can understand that there's a common human thing going on here. And that common human thing, like Esperanto, will hopefully break break down some of the religious conflict and, and violence and misunderstanding and, and allow us to see each other as part of something collective. And I think that, I think that, that work is very important. And that's where I see the role of perennialism being played, not to create some sort of perennialistic porridge. Just, just one final note. I think that 
I don't think that mysticism always got it right. I think that there are many moments in mysticism where where we, we made mistakes, where the mystics made mistakes. And a lot of times the mystics said things that were that were just bad and hateful. And I don't think the mystics were, they're human too. They're not perfect people. They're maybe more awake and more enlightened, but but still human and they and they, they can still definitely, even if even within the theories themselves, they can they can fall back to be human. If they they can fall out of enlightenment, that's a possibility. Um, and I think that we have to be on guard. And I'll be the first to admit that in, in my own tradition, mystics have espoused a lot of xenophobia and a lot of very bad metaphysics about the about people who aren't Jewish. And understandably, they're writing in a time when there was a tremendous, tremendous amount of persecution, and they're writing about people that were pillaging and and murdering their families. And and it's understandable the moment that they were writing from. But we have to be honest with our own traditions and say this is the good parts, and these are the parts that can be left behind and, and can be acknowledged. But don't we don't have to perpetuate them? And and today within Jewish mysticism, there are people who say no, we have to perpetuate the entire thing, and everything that was said is absolutely sacred and cannot be changed. And I, and I think that the same way that those mystics used their own hearts and minds and souls to discern what was right in their moment and may have made mistakes, we have to use our own mind. God gave us a mind to think and to and a soul to, to discern and a heart to feel. And we have to do that with our own traditions. And I think that even up into, even the perennialists sometimes make mistakes. I think of someone like Blavatsky, you know, the, the, the mother of theosophy, she was living in a moment where there was a lot of scientific or, or what, you know, these pseudo-scientific, what they assume were scientific race theories. And she developed a very, um, on, on, on one hand, a very, very beautiful notion of theosophy and the, you know, the, the brotherhood of humanity, even if the language was somewhat uh, non-inclusive of, of people who weren't just brothers, but also sister, sister of humanity. But there was also a lot of terrible scientific racism and we're allowed to call that out and see that and say, yes, she did great things. She also made mistakes and we can take the good, leave the bad and, and move forward in advance. And I think the same thing for someone like Sean. I think that a lot of the direction that the traditionalists went in their antipathy towards modernity, and this is something which I've said a few times on the channel, is, is it something that we can reevaluate and we can reevaluate. Yes, there are challenges in modernity, but the response of the traditionalists that often associated mysticism uh, or mystical truth with power and some of the directions that that led into you know, fascist forms of mysticism where, where power became became the thing to be pursued and and there was a real ironically there was real othering that there's us and them there's the there's the enlightened mystics and then there's the unenlightened rest of humanity or there's the us you know the white race and these these things we have to be aware of and we have to we have to try and do mysticism at its best we have to try and take its fruits and acknowledge its thorns and leave those behind for as historical curiosities and i think the work of being vigilant um, with the traditions that we're taking, with the thinkers that we're taking, um, is very important work. Yeah, I think you you pinned down one of the things that I'm pretty adamant about. That even I loved when Huxley said it is that you can't hold ego and divine at the same time. You can't be clinging on to both. And I and I find I find that sort of the the paradox that even mystics can get caught in. Um, even after their experience, um, when they're trying to explain, or um, even the idea of just like you know saying like, "Oh, you guys are all going to hell" or something like that, it, it's it's this idea where the ego sort of penetrates into our concept of the divine. And uh, I think what perennialism has taught me, if if anybody wants to know what kind of utility perennialism has, <laughs> is that it sort of forces upon me this um, dying aspect that at every moment I have to let go of whatever concept of God or divine I have. Um, and I think it has been such a fruitful and beautiful experience. I think in the beginning it was very painful and I'm not gonna deny that it's not painful because at, at any moment it's, it's um, yeah, it, it's, it's definitely painful um, th that whatever concept you originally had of divine, you almost forced to let go of it. But the beauty is that when you let go of it, you're able to suddenly have this communication with others that you didn't originally have. And I think, you know, <laughs> perhaps this is, 
I mean, if I were to have any naive argument, this would be my naive argument that I know some people wouldn't agree upon, uh, wouldn't accept, you know, would have to be more rigorous in my thinking for this. But I think experientially, there is this dying that perennialism sort of demands if you want to be, uh, if you want to understand what perennialism is trying to say. Um, and it's, it's, and the only, the ironic part about perennialism is that if you really want to understand perennialism, it's basically saying the only way that you would understand perennialism is by being the best Christian that you can be, the best Muslim that you can be, the best uh, Jew that you can be, the best, you know, and, and so on. It's this through the particular, um, that you begin to understand, um, where the particular has already set, um, we could say set principles and, and practices that encourage us to achieve this death, this ego death, right? And that no matter if I'm praying, if I'm meditating, everything is sort of contributing and um, helping me along to reach this ego death. I think the problem is that most of us don't acknowledge this um, ego and ego death involved when we try to discuss um, theosophy and, and, and theology. We don't, we don't understand how embodied we are when we discuss these concepts, how everything sort of reflects when we talk about God and the divine. Um, and, and I think that's what was so beautiful when you talked about languages is that languages themselves force you to be embodied. Um, and I think there's even been studies where even if you were to sort of pick up a new language, um, they say like you start to kind of your personality changes a little bit just because of the, the language that you get into. Um, so I find that very fascinating. I think there's, yeah, I think that's there's something to really say about that embodiment and, and provocativeness that perennialism provides for us. Um, yeah, I'll pass it over to you. Yeah, I mean, those are all like such rich themes, and I think they're they're really important themes. It's also <laughs> it's funny we're using this word perennialism as if it's its own thing. I don't I don't think perennialism is its own. It's not a, it's not it's not a new religion. It's not its own. It's just a way of understanding mysticism. I think and, and mysticism, um, many ways of defining it, but in this context, perhaps best as, as simply the heart of each tradition, right? Um, so whoever's listening and, and thinks we're talking about some new thing here, we're, we're, I don't think we're talking about anything new at all. This notion of, 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 of death and ego and God are all super fascinating themes. One of the most interesting comparative themes that I, that I think first caught my attention when I got interested in this perennialist approach to religion and mysticism was the necessity of death, um, and which, which sounds like a very morbid kind of thing, but I don't think it is at all. This, the notion that nothing truly grows unless it's able to let go of what it was up until that point, right? So a very beautiful example is given of the seed that is put into the ground, that the seed itself must decompose before the tree can sprout forth. This notion that so long as we're clinging on to whatever concept of self we have, the you know, an egoic concept of self, or a concept of God, and we're holding tight onto that concept, that concept cannot expand. We cannot expand, we cannot grow. Our concept of God cannot grow. And what has to happen is, is that we have to die. We have well, God has to die in some sense, which means that we have to be able to let go of that. And that is what we mean by death of ego. We mean that what we thought we were, we're able to fully rid ourselves of that. And we enter into a place of nothingness, into a place of darkness. And from there, we can reemerge, created anew, like the phoenix from the flames. Or our concept of God goes through a process of denial and a negative theology until something positive can reemerge out of that. And it's, it's an incredibly beautiful concept and I think a concept which you really find across traditions and a concept which you find in nature itself which which gives it all the more persuasive and poetic power in in Jewish mysticism just to give some brief examples in Jewish mysticism we speak about the process of bitul hayash this nullification of the ego of the self so that we can come to a state of dveikot the state of cleaving and oneness with God but the self has to be shed we have to let go of the self to get there in Islam we talk about fanna in annihilation so that we can come to a state of baka to be to be standing at one united with god in, in christianity we use the metaphor of crucifixion that we crucify the self so that we can be resurrected in god and these these metaphors are so beautiful and so rich just to sampling from the western traditions and i think that in embrace it's it's, it's very easy to talk about them it's harder to actually die it's, it's a painful process to let go 
of our highest concepts or a concept of ourself. And ourself is usually the concept, which is our central concept that holds the glue of all, all of our reality is we, we're at that center. But without letting go of that, there really is no liberation because the self can be a trap and the self can be, the ego can be a real trap. And we can be driven an entire lifetime to chase things that we don't really want because the ego is compelling us forward, this pride that we have and, and, and the competition. And the ability to let go of that is, that is liberation, that is rebirth. And it's so important. There's one of one of the there's a saying that circulated amongst the pre-Socratics, maybe Parmenides, but don't quote me. He said that philosophy, or even Socrates, philosophy, the point of philosophy is to teach us how to die. And I think that means both things. It means to teach us how to die at the end of life, you know, when we come to our biological death, how to prepare for that, how to transition into whatever comes next, and God knows what comes next. But it also teaches us how to die moment to moment, day to day. And there's, there's a beautiful notion in Judaism that, that every time we sleep, there's a there's an element of death there. There's a one sixtieth of death. And when we, we wake up in the morning, we wake up with the potential to be reborn every single day. And we thank God. We say, We thank God for giving us our soul back with faith that we can choose to be who we want to who we who we are today, because there was no reason why we should have woken up. We could have you know, died in our sleep, and that would be the end of it. And being reborn every morning is a chance for that. And there are many, many rituals in in, in many mystical traditions. In my own tradition, there's a, the ritual of mikvah, of bathing in, in water immersion in a, in a ritual bath, which gets picked up by Christianity in the form of baptism and, and Christian mystics. And what happens is when you go into the water, and this is just one practice to try and embody this idea, right? It's not just about talking about these things, it's actually putting them to practice to embody. How do we embody death? It's a very strange concept. Death seems to be a disembodied thing. We're leaving our body. But while we're doing our biological lives, we have to embody these processes. And just, just one example of many. And, and once we get thinking, you can see how this theme is really across mystical traditions in their in their embodied practices. The practice of mikvah, of immersing oneself in, in water completely, right? Which is something which was done ritually throughout Judaism and then was taken up very seriously by the mystics. The way that the mystics understand it is that when you're underwater, entirely submerged you are in a state of death because because hypothetically potentially if you stay there if you stay under the water right for long enough and not that long even like 40 seconds two minutes three minutes max you're dead and you're not coming back up your body is going down to, like to the bottom and until you're being pulled up god forbid but what the mystics would do is that they would meditate they would visualize as if their body was dying because they were underwater they were in the state of no breath and breath is life says the verse in Genesis that God breathes, God breathes, blows the breath of life into Adam's nostrils. And when that breath is gone, we can, we're in a state of death, really, at least in potential. And when we emerge from the water, we allow whatever we want to let go of ourselves, our habits and our conceptions and our ego, we allow that to stay behind in the water. We allow that to drown. And we we're allowed to, we emerge new, we emerge fresh. When, people, when the process of, of conversion in Judaism, Giyur, is a process that ends with a ritual immersion in a mikvah. And the notion is that the person that came to that, to, that, to that process, to the end of the process, that person stays behind in the water. And it's a new person which steps out. It's, it's a newborn person. Ketinik Shunel Adami, says the Talmud. And we, so this is just one ritual out of many, many rituals. And this is a deeply embodied ritual. You have to get fully naked. You're getting into cold water. You, you feel it in your body. It's not it's not hypothetical. It's not theoretical. It's a deeply embodied experience. And if you can sit there and meditate and you can hold your breath and feel your chest pulsating, wanting to breathe and, and allow the bits of you that you don't want to breathe anymore to go peacefully and softly into the darkness and to emerge a new person in the light. These are very powerful metaphors and very powerful practices. And I think that we don't die enough in contemporary society, which is a weird thing to say. But I think we I think. I mean, it's, it's been studied a lot by sociologists how we're so distant from death. We don't see death anymore, right? The, in, back in ancient, back not so long ago, you know, before the Industrial Revolution, in every home, there was a room where someone had died, right? There was, a, there was, a, there was an elderly member of the family who, who, who we, had, we had seen passing. I'd spent some time doing some community work where, where I had the great fortune to be around people in their last moments. And it's not something that happens in contemporary society. We've, 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 like there's this hygienification, there's this, there's this, there's this cleaning, like that humans can't tolerate death. And, and I think that, I think that we, we need to, death is, there is no life without death and no, and no death without life. And 
And I think that we need to embrace death in our own lives on, on a daily basis, uh, on a, on a, in, in our ritual practices, in our conceptions. Um, and it's not, I don't think it's morbid, I think it's a life-giving concept. Uh, memento mori, to, to remember the fact that we are mortal. There's nothing more empowering and liberating than knowing that we're going to die. What, what more powerful idea is there to stop us, to get us off the rat race of, of absurdity, chasing after luxury brands and fancy cars, to know that we're going to die. We're going to be put in a little box and laid into the ground and the maggots will feast on our body. Like what, what, what more liberating thought is there? And I think that, um, I think that the mystics have a beautiful relationship with death. And, um, and it's, it's a theme, which is another theme, which is very close to my heart. And I appreciate being able to talk about it with you. Oh, beautiful, man. Wow. The, uh, I, I've been reading some of, um, God is a verb. Mm, nice. And he's, I, I, it's funny cause I, I've been reading William James and I had picked up God is a verb and then, and the Zohar. And suddenly I find myself dropping William James and got, and I started, I just God as a verb was just so fascinating to me because I had not gone into Judaism yet until now. And I think what you had said about this embodiment of going into the water, right? This mystical experience of going into the water. I was like, you know, that, that makes a lot of sense, at least the way that the Jewish mystics talk about, you know, that there is this level of the soul, right? The, the, the lowest of the soul is sort of connected to the flesh. But as we sort of rise higher to the levels of the soul, um, there is like aspects that is just pure, just pure soul. And um, I think what I loved about David Cooper is that he used God as this, not like this static being, but is this process, this. And, it, and I think that's a beautiful way because that demands death, doesn't it? Process mm. demands death. Change yeah. demands death. Um, I recently wrote an article on my Substack about suicide because uh, I was in the army for six years and some of the, the biggest problems in the army is suicide mm -hmm. um, and, and, and they're trying to solve it. But I thought just <laughs> this paradoxical thinking has sort of broadened avenues for the way I approach this. I thought, what if suicide in itself is not a mechanism that should be avoided? It's just the way, I think the problem is exactly what we have been talking about is the problem of the way we view the self if we understand that there is this antagonism between a false self and a true self, um, then we could see that suicide, the, the urgings or the feelings of wanting to commit death is actually a yearning for the false self to sort of rid its way and approach a new perspective. Um, unfortunately, if you don't have this concept of a false self and a true self, then what you would linger on to is that suicide is the soul clinging to what you believe is your true self. And therefore the only act, the only way out is this death. Um, so I, I found it very important that, you know, we make this distinction, that we embody this distinction between, is it possible that my concept of myself is not true? That when I feel that i want to end my life, how I interpret that feeling is so crucial um, that we end up seeing that there is, it's, it's an ironic and a, it's a literal and non-literal death, right? It, it's this embodiment of like, yes, I do want to die, but that is the false self that wants to die, hmm. right? That is the, the, the true self that is sort of yearning for its um, rising. Um, and, I, and I think sort of Hegel has kind of helped me work a little bit this out where even if I were to sort of be like, okay, this is my false self, right? Now this is my true self. I'd have to get ready. I'd have to get ready to get rid of my concept of what I call the true self, right? So we can constantly be in this dialectical process of dying and, and, and sort of birthing. And, and I think that's so important. Um, and it's something that I kind of argued in my, essay about suicide is that maybe the problem is that when we say we fear death, suicide is really this mechanism that urges us towards death. It is not a sort of harmful, unhealthy urging. I think everybody has, you know, healthy uh, thoughts about suicide. It's just, it's the way that we think about the, uh, the self that is, that be more harmful than, um, you know, we approach this. Um, 
but yes, uh, you know, your concept of water, I started thinking about baptism, right? There is no guarantee when someone dips me in the water that he's going to bring me up, even yeah. though, you know, I've seen it many times, but it could just be the case that he doesn't bring me up. Nice. Um, <laughs> and uh, Islam with its uh, wudu, right? You know, you sort of have these sure. daily um, interactions with the water, cleansing of the yes. body before prayer. And, and yeah. I thought, again, those beautiful examples of what you were saying. So, yeah. Yeah. Wow. Um, I think these are, I think these are important topics and they're, they're heavy topics. Um, and there, there are many people, people that I know personally that, um, suffer very, very deeply and, and experience pain, uh, pain of existence, pain in their lives very, very heavily and feel like the only possible way out, the only possible solution and exit is, to take their own lives. And I, I've had close friends who have taken their lives and it's something which is um, incredibly painful and incredibly, incredibly close to my heart. And I, I think, I think it's important to say firstly that um, anyone that is listening or anyone that's, that's coming across uh, your, your works, um, if they are experiencing suicidal ideation, they should seek out help. Uh, professional help if they can access it or to talk to people that love them and there are people that love them there are people that love you and and I and even if in our darkest moments we don't feel so uh, it, it definitely is the case and I think that it's I think that sometimes we forget that we each have a unique voice and a unique light to share in this world and in an act of suicide we deprive the world of the unique light that we have to share and it's very hard in those moments to believe that we have a unique light to share in the world. And it seems like all we have to share with the world is, is pain and hurt and destruction and the world may be better off, better off without us. But for anyone that's listening now or later that feels that way, I want them to know that they do have something beautiful to share with the world. And, and it must be the case, otherwise they wouldn't be here. If they're here, that means that they have something incredibly valuable and unique that no one else can do, no one else in the world. And, and to deprive the world of that would be a great loss to, to you and to I and to every single person. And I think that's, I think that's important to know. I think I, I, this framing is a very, very interesting one. And, and I, I take it from your time in the military that you're speaking also from personal experience and, and, and may have lost colleagues and comrades um, to, to, to the battle of life. And, and life is, life is a battle, no doubt. I think that's, I think that's a very interesting framing, which 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 I haven't considered, and I appreciate you bringing up this notion that that the drive sometimes to to end our own lives, uh, to end the suffering that we experience, may be may be a drive towards to instead of suicide, right? To which is a death of the self. Instead, it can be can be conceptualized or can be can be pivoted towards an ego side. Right to to a, to a death of the ego, to a death of the conception of self that is holding us in places of pain and suffering, and there there is a lot of pain and suffering, and this is not to diminish that. And, and sometimes that pain and suffering seems that it is beyond our control and, and out of our hands to to deal with. But 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 very very often the 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 pain and suffering that's that's the truest pain of suffering is not simply a circumstantial pain and suffering that that is imposed upon us but it's but it's the pain and suffering inside of us and there 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 needs to be a way within rich spiritual speech between sorry within rich spiritual traditions that don't only talk about roses and flowers and, and sunny days but talk about the hardest parts of life to acknowledge that people experience these things and to acknowledge that that there may be fruitful spiritual ways of conceptualizing of letting go of that of, of of allowing ourselves to to commit acts of ego side to, to to let go to allow that part of us to die and to have that ritualized and to do that with with the assistance of of, of people that are close to us and people that 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 have our best intentions at hand and with professional help if it's accessible to be able to to be able to to say that that part of me which is which is suffering which is which is not which feels like life is not worth living anymore that part of me can die and I can let go of that and I can be reborn and I can feel something different and it, and it may not happen once and it may not happen overnight and it may be many many rituals and many many moments many many hours of meditation and contemplation to try and come to that place 
of, of wholeness where we can let go and let that part of us die. Um, but, but it seems to be a very rich direction and avenue for thought. And I, I would be curious to see uh, if anyone in, in, in the fields of mental health have, have been exploring this direction. I know some of the work that's been done recently from John Hopkins um, on, on mystically induced, um, sorry, psychedelically induced mystical experiences where people are able to get past addiction that they've been struggling with for years and deal with trauma that they've been struggling to deal with for years and and, and hundreds of hours of therapy or, or suicidal ideation and able to let go of that. And what seems to be what seems to be coming out of, of the research is that it's it's what's happening specifically is that it's the mystical experience which is precipitated by these these substances which is carrying that is the active ingredient in this transformation and transformation means right transformation means the leaving of one to embrace the new that's what transformation means and that's what that's what initiation means initiation means that there was a there was, there was a past self which we were able to let go of and move into the new one and and i think that the possibility is there and i think that this holds out hope for people and i think if someone does feel like there is no chance in life and does feel like they've exhausted every every option every possibility i would i would encourage people to to explore their pursuit of a mystical path and the pursuit of of the the possibility that those experiences may bring um, and whether that's through meditation or whether that's through religion or whether that's through love and servitude and, and kindness or whether that's through psychoactive chemicals to to explore that as a possibility as a therapeutic possibility to allow that transformation to happen and i think these are very rich possibilities and and i think that th this notion of embracing the the process of reality. So David Cooper in, in the wonderful book there that you mentioned in God is a Verb speaks about <clears throat> how God in the, in the Hebrew Bible is referred to as yud -Hey and vav -Hey, as that, that which was, is, and will be. It's this, it's this verb which is moving throughout time. It's this wave always coming in and going. And this notion of embracing the deep change of reality uh, who was at Heraclitus who says that we can never step into the same river twice because we're always changing, the river's always changing. And whether it's someone like Alfred North Whitehead who, who gives us a very beautiful elaborate metaphysics of process theology, process, sorry, process ontology, which is then worked into process theology by later thinkers. These are these are these are beautiful notions. There's one, there's one beautiful, beautiful metaphor that comes out of the Kabbalists and the Hasidic thinkers, the tradition that I belong to, which is this notion that existence itself kind of flickers in and out of existence between being and non-being. It's called motiv le mati, uh, present and not present, or found and not found. Uh, and, and the notion is, if you can imagine that there's some sort of film, if, if whoever's watching the screen now, the screen is like flashing at a very high speed that is just quicker than the eye's refresh rate. So it looks like it's continuous, but really it's not, right? If you slow down, you would see actually there's frames here. There's like 28 or 36 frames per per second or however, whatever the thing is. So the Kabbalists say that the same way that our, that like our eyes do that reality itself is not, is not constant and is not perpetual. It's, it's flickering in and out of existence just so quickly that we don't, we don't notice it. But if we can like slow down time through mystical meditation, mystical practice, we can actually kind of see how everything is fluctuating into being and non-being. It's this, the tide of reality. It's the heartbeat, the pulse of reality, which comes in and out of reality. And because it's constantly being coming in and out of reality, recreated fresh every moment by the word of God, according to the Kabbalists, that means that we don't have to be defined by our pasts and we don't have to be indebted to our futures because reality is constantly flickering in and out of existence. And every moment is new. Every moment is a novelty. Every moment is a chidush in their language. And we can, we can seize on this moment right now and choose to change and choose to renew ourselves. And that's deeply rooted into their metaphysics of this metaphysics of process, not just process, metaphysics of, of, of this flickering reality, being and non-being constantly. And it's such a powerful, beautiful, poetic metaphor. Um, and I think, I think there's a lot of healing to be done with these ideas. I think there's a lot of, a lot of, a lot of trauma that, that collectively and individually, uh, we can, we can help ourselves and help each other overcome by embracing these alternative, uh, metaphysics that we can find in the, in the world's mystical traditions. Yeah, wonderfully said, Avi. I mean, you know, to sort of reiterate what you said, right? Like everything that we're talking about here is not to sort of diminish any of the feelings that people have. But I think, uh, you know, one of the most profound, I, I forget her, the psychologist's name, but I think one of the most profound things that I heard from her was 
she's like, when I ask somebody, um, you know, uh, when they, you know, when they're talking about when they want to die, she specifically asks some more specific questions. She says, what parts of you want to die? And I think, I think that's a very useful uh, method of approaching when we have these sort of, because, you know, feelings themselves, they're very encompassing. It's, it's, it's a full body um, thing. It's not, you know, <laughs> it's very hard to determine at that moment when I'm interpreting my feelings exactly how I want to go about these feelings. And, um, you know, and, and again, my experience of the army sort of really shed light on, you know, my, my own thoughts of suicide, my, 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 my comrades thoughts of suicide. It really just gave me a lot of to think about the way we approach death. And, you know, so some of the things that I, I don't necessarily agree with the current, you know, mental approach, or let me, let me put it this way, the most prominent mental health approach is that suicide is sort of, you know, shush, shush. Like if you even say it, you know, you're going to be quarantined for, you know, a couple of days and then you sort of, uh, you know, I, I, there's some problems with it. And I think psychoanalysis have, has, has shed some useful critiques on this. Um, but yeah, I think everything you said was so, so good on that point that this aim towards death is what fundamentally you could even say like death is process death is this sort of divine I, I think thinking of God as this process really shows that whenever I try to pin him down it's it and it's not it right it's like when I were to take like a picture right I'd say oh look at me at the Grand Canyon but at the same time it's the idea that it's it and it's not it because I'm showing you a photo <laughs> it's not actually the Grand Canyon it is but it's not um, and, and the same thing when we talk about quantum physics, I, I always kind of laugh to myself a little bit when the sciences are sort of bewildered when they when they sort of try to pin down the you know the, the atom or something. They're like it, every time we try to pin it down, it moves. <laughs> it's sort of going somewhere else. And they started you know raising the problem of like, wait, is it is it me that sort of interfering with the process? Um, you know th these questions of you know how is it that you can't, you can't separate yourself from reality. Um, and I think the biggest harm being done is this idea of like, there's this pure objectivity that I can sort of disentangle myself completely from my subjectivity. And that's just not the case. Um, and, and I think it's useful to think of the idea that divine, divine itself is this, you know, sort of pure subjectivity. It's such a pure subjectivity that it is objective. Right? It is that sort of paradox that carries itself and that we as human beings, uh, and I always loved Ibn Rabi's notion of this, and you sort of talked about this in, in the Jewish mysticism, this flickering in and out. Um, what Ibn Rabi talks about this idea of the human being is like this in-between, right? And if I just think about myself as this in-between, I understand that I can never pin myself down. And just the way I can never pin myself down, I can never pin the divine down. But if we understand that this is a beautiful reality, a beautiful process, because the dialectic of love is the only way that this process can exist in. <laughs> there needs to be a constant interaction between the subject and the other subject. And in order for me to have a relationship with the divine, I have to be constantly, as Ibn Rabi says, finding God. I have to be constantly bewildered by the divine. Um, and, and this constant bewilderment is what demands death. Um, which I, which I, which I find so, so beautiful. Um, and I, and I wish sometimes that I could try to, you know, explain this in more tangible ways, um, when people are sort of against religion and sort of against, and, and, and I think in my opinion, you don't, I think, it, I don't know how to put it. I, I think for me, it's best that I just go into it. I just start doing the practices and then, and then, you know, I could sit, uh, actually, it's funny enough. I, um, once I started picking up Cooper's book, I emailed a rabbi and I said, look, I would like to learn more about Judaism. <laughs> so we, we are, we're planning a meeting. Um, but I, I was just like, I just want to already sort of get involved in the practices and sort of get taught um, rather than sort of, you know, being caught in a sediment of theology. And, 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 I, and I, I think there is utility to that, but there is, there is a danger to that. You know getting caught in the sediment of theology and uh a lot of people are afraid to sort of 
I think what I like about the mystics is they're not afraid to sort of, you know, be kind of heretical sometimes. <laughs> but the thing is, they're not being heretical. It, it's it's a it's, it's a hard thing to explain, but I think paradoxical thinking is very useful. And, and, and it's this paradox of thinking that has really helped my spiritual progress, my, my understanding of reality, um, that if we just consider for a moment the way that we think is that we always have to isolate a thing in order to understand it. And because we isolate a thing to understand it, we are missing everything else around it. Um, and, and I think um, that kind of you know, puts our thinking in a stasis, doesn't, it's hard to think in movement. I think I've always been trying to express that. It's hard to think in movement rather than just sort of simple binaries. <laughs> wow, this is, this is very fun. I just, I just, I think we're having so much fun here. I didn't even realize that we've already, uh, <laughs> we've gone by an hour here. So we may, I may have to um, head off after, after this last round, but, but <laughs> it's also, it's been it's been it's been beautiful to get to sit down with you, Javier, and and begin to. It takes time to, to to kind of meet minds and to meet hearts and begin to to warm up. And I hope this is really just the beginning of of our friendship and relationship. That would be something which I would very much appreciate and welcome. And yeah, these themes are all themes which you just keep you keep bringing up themes which are super super like close to my heart and things which I've spent a lot of time thinking about and and, and feeling into. Yeah, the, the notion that uh, that we need to stop thinking in terms of objective and subjective, and we need some new categories to think about that. And, and I don't understand the sciences of, of quantum science, and I don't know if there are that many people that do. But it's very clear that that our present ontologies and epistemologies that divide very, very, very clearly and, and strictly between subject and object just don't don't hold up anymore to to the empirical data that we're seeing. And we need some sort of participatory ontology to use the wording of, of, um, what's his, what's the fellow's name? Um, his name is Jorge Ferreira, Ferrer, 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 I don't know how to pronounce it. It's a tone, I, I recommend it. Um, yeah, so that's, that's a fascinating direction. And I think part of that is also embracing the paradoxical thinking that comes along with that. And I think that there are new, the, 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 the way that we've built our thinking on Aristotelian logic um, with its bivalent system, with its lore being challenged in very fascinating ways. There's, there's a logician out there whose name is Graham Priest, who's doing some very interesting work on non-classical um, logic, on dialetheisms, on, on paradoxical logic, um, which I think is a very, very fascinating direction. and and. I do see, as I'm assuming you as well, and your listeners probably, I do see a lot of these directions converging on the same realizations. And, and what those realizations are, it's still a bit hard to say because they're still very mysterious and they're still, but it does seem to us at least that whatever these, the convergences that are that are coming upon us, whether it's from science or mathematics or logic, um, physics, it does seem that the same convergences were the same things that were being discussed by Ibn Arabi and by Nagarjuna and by Shankara and by the Arizal and uh, and by the Buddha, like it does, it does, it does certainly seem so. Um, Ibn Arabi, as you, you've been quoting here a bunch, talks about God as hua la hua, that that which he is but he is not, that we are God but we're not God, and it's sort of this language of trying to describe how how we are but we're not um, is is trying to get into that paradox. And I think ultimately, I think ultimately, I have to agree with what you said right towards the end, which is that it's a lot of fun and very beautiful and important even to be dealing with these paradoxes and to think about them and to think about them rigorously and historically and linguistically and to try and tease out the directions and what contributions we may be able to make and how we can articulate that and how we can internalize that. But ultimately, we have to find ways that we can live these paradoxes and be these paradoxes. And ultimately, our words are going to mean nothing at all if we're not able to, to live the way that what these things demand of us. And I think I think amongst the philosophers, it's very clear uh, that there were some philosophers that were able to really embody what it was that they were that they were teaching. I think I think the, the example that always comes to mind, not to speak ill of the dead, but he's been dead long enough, so maybe we can, is uh, Schopenhauer and Spinoza. Schopenhauer and Spinoza, their metaphysics in many ways were, were quite similar, um, both by and large monists, uh, which meant they, they believed that reality was fundamentally one and unified, um, with different points of emphasis, but but metaphysically, there was a lot, a lot of overlap. 
But Spinoza, we know from historical accounts, and and I don't mean this to to besmirch his name, and he had a very hard childhood, and his mother gave him a rough time, and his parents. There's all kinds of reasons that we can have compassion. But he he just was not a very nice person as an adult, and there's all kinds of accounts of of him. He pushes this this old woman down the stairs because she was annoying him, and he was just very irritable, and he was really not a good person to be around. He, it's not something that you'd want company with. Although he was a genius of astronomical stature, Spinoza, on the other hand, no less a genius and uh, and similar in his metaphysics, is a man who was incredibly kind and incredibly generous and incredibly courteous and loving and forgiving. He was like a real saint is the way that he was described. Russell speaks about him as, as the, the noblest amongst the philosophers. And it's because he really, really deeply lived what he believed. And, and whether or not that says something about the truth of their propositions, was Spinoza more true? Was it, are his metaphysics better because he was, because he lived them? I don't know if that's the case, but I think what it means is that Spinoza was able to live a more beautiful life because he lived it in accordance with his highest ideals. And Schopenhauer, while he had, for whatever reason, and reason is not of his own fault, I'm not saying this to, 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 to fault him or to shade him, but he wasn't able to live to those ideals. And, and he was the one that suffered and the people around him in the process. And, and the question is, can we live up to these ideals that we're talking about? Can we embrace what it means to live in paradox, to live, to live in process, to live in rediscovery, to live in love, to live in compassion and service? If we can, then this discussion will have been worth its salt. But if we can't, then we'll have to try again some other time. Well, I really, I really enjoyed this talk, uh, Zavi. And um, to, to kind of shed light, on, and I know I've been quoting David Cooper and uh, Ibn Rabi, but uh, I think the interaction between us, um, just to kind of give a tangible example, is that the way David Cooper says, you know, every relationship, when when confronted, it always demands a sort of new level of awareness. And I think that is like a perfect way to sort of look at the dialect of love, um, you know, and and. And I, and I really love what you said about Spinoza. I think that was like the first thing that I absolutely admired about Spinoza was that I feel I've always felt like there is this huge gap between the, the ideas and, and the person. And I think one of the most heartbreaking things that I had encountered that was, was my fascination with uh, Reiner Maria Rilke, um, where he was sort of so... Uh, in, so enamored by his uh, poetry and everything that I, I, I struggled with accepting how he sort of neglected his family and, and, and sort of neglected every other relationship in pursuit of this poetry. And, and maybe there's room for lenience and I'm always willing to accept it that maybe his temperament could only have gone so far, um, but it really sort of shattered my notion about, you know, when I pursue something, should I be so neglectful of these other people and other things around me. It, it just it just didn't seem to add up um, for me. Um, so I, I really really felt the gap between the, the philosophy and the person. Um, and and Rilke's writing is so beautiful that it, it's like you know it, it's it really it really is so beautiful and, and and there's really a good case to argue for like you know he doesn't even need a, necessarily to fall in a specific religion to sort of experience the divine in certain ways. But um, it's this sort of wanderless danger i think that can uh, be a little bit hard to discern um, and i think that's why tradition kind of has like a a nice like little common rope to hang on um for us in, in case we get a little bit lost um not to sort of argue for like traditionalism or something but just to sort of just say that there is a utility to the the gaps between you know somebody emphasizing like hey if you go this way it's a little bit you know <laughs> like muslims say it's a little bit kufr if you go this way you know it's 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 you it's a utility that way um but yes uh really enjoyed this conversation um if there's anything last thing you want to say zevi uh i'll let you and uh, we'll we'll close i just want to say thank you so much for for having me and for 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 reaching out and for inviting me into conversation and i think i think the beauty of this moment is that we we can begin to have this conversation together globally you know i went from being a very um <laughs> very, very socially <laughs> maladjusted, um, what's it called, uh, a very introverted, you know, bookworm, I still I still am, and I still spend most of my time reading books. But, uh, but the beauty of, of challenging ourselves to, to start sharing our ideas online, and um, which is why I'd like to 
congratulate and commend what you're doing, both in your written film and your video film, is that we, we, we open ourselves up to conversation. We open ourselves up to being in these dialogues of love as opposed to just doing it on our own. And I think that we are all the richer for the for doing so. And I feel enriched by having been able to sat to sit with you now on this beautiful Saturday night. And uh, I just want to thank you for that for that opportunity. Well, <laughs> I'm honored and also very thankful at the same time. So, uh, you know, same to you. But um, other than that, uh, we'll close. And everybody, thank you guys for watching. And uh, I'm pretty sure it, it's possible that you will see more of me, Zevi, uh, have a conversation. Um, but other than that, I, I thought, yeah, this went really well.